Hello and welcome to episode 66 of the How to Survive podcast. This week we are tackling the Japanese cult classic Battle Royale. So if you haven't seen Battle Royale, go away and watch it. It is available on Netflix in the UK. Next week we are watching the hot new film on everyone's lips, Arrival. It will be available in cinemas from the 11th of November. Uh, and get out and watch it because it is supposed to be one of this year's best films. And once you've seen it, then please get in touch. The Twitter is at How to Survive Pod. The email address is How to Survive Show.com. Now let's go on with Battle Royale. <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 66 of the How to Survive podcast. This episode we're going to the Far East for our first Japanese language film. It's of course the year 2000 classic Battle Royale. Joining me as ever is Joe Konnichiwa. And we'll be tackling this classic film directed by Kinji Fukusaku. Who you may remember from the 1970 movie Tora Tora Tora. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. If you haven't seen Battle Royale, now's your chance to duck out uh, and go watch it. It's available on Netflix, as I'm sure you're tired of us telling you. Uh, and it's a great film, so you should go watch it. If you like The Hunger Games, it's basically exactly the same. Exactly the same. But with more blood and more Japanese language. Yeah. So let's recap the plot. Spoilers from this point onwards. So, Battle Royale. A class of Japanese schoolchildren are kidnapped and taken to a remote island where they are made to participate in the annual Battle Royale. This, the result of the BR Act, was an attempt made by the Japanese government to combat juvenile delinquency by killing off great swathes of schoolchildren and actually incentivizing staying away from school where you run the risk of being made to participate, which shows what could generously be called a lack of joined up thinking by those in charge. Once briefed on the rules, which are murder each other and that there can be only one survivor, each child is given a bag containing a supplies and an item, which could be a weapon like a machine gun or something useless like a paper fan. The game is run by their teacher, Kitano, with the help of the Japanese army. The game then begins, but not before Kitano kills two of the students for misbehaving, including our hero Shuya's best friend. He tearfully laments his passing. In the game's first few hours, many children are killed and Kiriyama, a transfer student, emerges as the most dangerous player. Meanwhile, Mitsuko emerges as principal murderess, killing several of her classmates who bullied her so bitterly at school. Yamamoto and Ogawa, two of the schoolchildren, refuse to resort to murder and instead tearfully and bitterly throw themselves from a cliff to be together in death. Kuramoto and Yoshimi another two set of schoolchildren, hang themselves for similar reasons, presumably crying bitter tears as well. While trying to signal our hero Shuya, Yukiko and Kusaka, two of the schoolchildren, are shot repeatedly by Kiriyama. Their demises are bitterly and tearfully mourned by Shuya. Shuya promises to protect fellow classmate Noriko, and the pair team up with Kawada, another transfer student who survived a previous battle royale. They are confronted by Kiriyama, who Shuya leads away as a distraction before jumping from a cliff into the ocean. The next day, Shuya awakens in a lighthouse, bandaged by classmate Yuki, who has a crush on him. The lighthouse is inhabited by five other schoolgirls from her clique, one of whom, Yuko, distrusts Shuya and attempts to poison him. However, her friend Yuka, I'm not making this up, eats the poisoned food herself, resulting in a shootout killing all the girls with the letter Y in their name apart from Yuko. She tearfully and bitterly mourns the deaths of her friends and throws herself from the lighthouse to her death. One of the students, Sugimura, seeks out the girl he loves, Kotohiki, in order to protect her. Kotohiki panics and shoots him six times. Sugimura lives just long enough to tearfully confess his love to a tearful Kotohiki, who bitterly regrets the tragic misunderstanding. Kotohiki is then shot by Mitsuku, who in turn is shot by Kiriyama. Such is life in Battle Royale. 
By this point, seven of the 42 students remain. Three boys work to hack into the system tracking the players, and while the army are distracted, try to drive a bomb into their compound. However, all three are tearfully shot dead by bitter <laughs> Kiriyama before their plans come to fruition, although Kiriyama is tearfully blinded in a resultant explosion. He is then shot bitterly dead by Kawada, leaving our tearful heroes as the final three. The trio use the microphones in their neck collars to fake their deaths, causing the army to leave the island, before finding and shooting Kitano, the teacher, remember him, who confusingly gets up from his apparent death and takes a phone call from his daughter before he dies. Kawada tearfully succumbs to various bitter injuries sustained during the game, leaving Shuya and Noriko tearful dual survivors of the Battle Royale and embittered fugitives from the law. And that's how Bitter Royale ends. <laughs> Cheerful and bitter all round. Yeah. So it's That's a good way to describe everything that happens. Yeah. Cheerful te- and bitter. I thought so. Basically, yeah. when I was watching the film, it occurred to me how much of the film is just two of the classmates are star crossed lovers yeah. or unrequited lovers. Yeah. And they find one another and then there's a big misunderstanding and they die. Yep. And then there's like a Romeo and Juliet sort of mourning, tragic death of romance moment. Yeah. And then another student emerges from the bushes and like shoots them dead. Yeah. But then before they can run away, they're shot in the back by someone and they're like, yeah. no, but I, I'm the I one was here to love. protect you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. A uh, lot, lot of that. Yeah. And it is, it is just one of the most hysterical films I've ever seen. Yes. Like, and I, I mean that in the sort of traditional sense, not like, laughing yeah. you know it's not really funny slapping it was it's quite funny in places uh, like yeah. the the intro to the whole like thing with the um the the the, the rules yeah the video that, like yeah. jolly japanese girl yeah like the very a very kawaii yeah. sort of uh japanese girl yeah and they have the sort of saccharine music and her yeah. like sort of hello yeah. welcome and to it, the battle royale and the, the teacher katano is like joining in like yeah. 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 <laughs> like a teacher would do. Yeah. Yeah, trying to get them all uh, up for it, basically. Um, yeah, it's it is it is ridiculous. It's yes. like the most melodramatic film I've ever seen. Yes. Like it is uh I, I basically did some research um which which didn't really come to any conclusions. IMD, IMDb and Wikipedia. Well no, it was I, I I was looking into whether or not like the melodramatic style is mm. a sort of characteristic of Japanese cinema nice. because I've seen a lot of Japanese films mm. and they're not all like this. You know, no. there's a lot of sort of, you know, uh, East Asian slow cinema, which is very like the opposite of this. Very spiritual and slow. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, and like, you know, the, basically any, any, everything that I could find was either, you know, about melo- Korean TV melodrama yeah. or things like, battle royale which are based on manga where everything's like really heightened emotions yeah. and you know and like sudden like bursts of action exactly yeah. so it'll go from like nothing to suddenly like dragon ball z yeah yeah and it's yeah but it is ridiculous like the the pattern of scenes yeah. are just this is it's either you know you're introduced to a couple and it's either this is so awful let us end our end our own lives before yeah we are forced to murder someone or it's Oh no, I didn't realise it was you, <laughs> Kurihama. Yeah. Like, I've always loved you. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Um, How many times does it like, because occasionally there's like a, uh, what do you call it, like a title card. Yeah, which I think is supposed to be their thoughts, is yeah, it? Yeah, but they're always like, uh, tell me, do you have a crush on anyone? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Okay. But it's, it's to its credit though, it's, yeah. it's, it's a thoroughly enjoyable watch. Yeah, yeah. And like the, the ultra violence, which you can't get around. Like yeah. it's an 18 certificate. I looked yes. up on the BBFC to see, and they were just like, there's n- nothing suggested. It's just like, it's 18. Like yeah. you never get it, around it. It's like, um, but it's like, it's like manga or like comic book violence. Yeah, like as well. someone will get their throat cut and it'll be like spurting. Yeah. Like fountains, fountains of, blood. of blood. Yeah. yeah. Like it's this sort of um, film that, uh, you know, it's, it's inspired by the same sorts of films that inspired Kill Bill. Like the, I think the, it's the funny, presentation of violence in that is is the most obvious Western example of hmm. that Japanese style. It's funny you should say that because in 2009, Quentin Tarantino said that Battle Royale is his favorite movie ever. 
in a yeah, it, it, which will surprise no one. <laughs> yeah, and also uh, one of the girls in it. You know, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember her name. Yeah, she's the one in the tracksuit. Okay, like, the runner. Yeah, the runner. Yeah, where have how, you seen her before? How does she die? Uh, she gets shot. I think. Oh, the the guy. The guy tries to rape her. Yeah. And she's like, I'll resist you with everything I have. She kills him. And then I think Mitsuko, Mitsuko. Right. She comes out and kills her. Oh, yeah. And, then, and she like, but she keeps running away and then she bumps into her Her love lover. interest. Yeah. And, like, then, and she's it, like, do you love anyone? And he's like, yes, but not you. Yeah. It's bizarre. It's so, it's just every death in this film is just like, yeah. oh, it's so sad. But where, where have you seen her before? The girl in the tracksuit? I, I assume she's in Kill Bill. She is. She plays Gogo. The, you know, the girl with the, uh, morning star right of course yeah 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 the uh the scene that always sticks with me for some reason is the lighthouse and mm. like that whole potted sort of sequence yeah which is quite well done and it's like that um ends in an almost reservoir dogs-esque standoff standoff yeah and uh that i think is the most heightened emotions in the film that sequence like when the girls are trying to you know are arguing amongst themselves who poisoned who yeah. and pointing the guns at each other. Like, the, yeah. I mean, the dialogue is fantastic. I mean, uh, let, let's hear a bit. Some of the shrill dialogue there from uh, Battle <laughs> yeah. Royale. And that's pretty representative of most of the film. Yeah. Um, it's just, it's a really unique film, I think, until The Hunger Games came out. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just like the, the, we were saying last week how The Hunger Games are doesn't pull any punches. This is like another level up. Yeah. You know, yeah. this is a like girl a, talk, a girl's whispering, yeah. a girl's whispering during the instructional video at the start and she gets a knife through her head yeah. uh, because of it. Yeah. It's pretty, pretty gory. Um, but I mean, you mentioned like the comic book manga violence. I think the framing of all the shots is lends itself pretty well to that as well. Like each shot, if you take it as a still, could be a panel in a comic. Yeah, I, I would imagine I said you this know, about uh, Breaking Bad as well. Like every every frame is like perfectly set up so that like one tiny thing is moving in it. Yeah, but yeah. The rest is just like a steady, like stationary shot. Yeah. I, I don't know. Yeah. I have to say though, it's, I think it's one of the less believable dystopias yeah like i just can't get the, like it's so, a leap of logic isn't it yeah well what is it it's, it's the you know to combat juvenile delinquency is the yeah. idea yeah supposedly they've introduced the br role. but i can't imagine how that would ever work or how you would ever get led to this well i guess the idea is that i don't want to be like forced to go into the battle royale so it, i better behave myself but like i presume the whole class isn't you know delinquent well, we see that they are because Noriko, who is our leading lady, she's the only one who shows up to class. Right. And she's like, where is everyone? And then the teacher's like, hey, just go home. Yeah. And then you get stabbed. Yeah. For no reason, basically. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I just, I just can't... Like, normally you can sort of see the event... Imagine the events that would lead to that yeah. being formed. And I just don't get that with Battle Royale. It's like it's a normal world other than the fact that they have this. But for some reason, it's just like accepted as part of society yeah which i know that a lot of you know dystopias are like that and you know black mirror yeah very in the but black mirror mindset at the moment black mirror is more of like a hyper real version of or like a hyper intense version of like things we already have yeah so yeah it'd be like if reality tv suddenly was about mm. capital punishment and example. it is like reality reality tv focused as it's, well it's not it? though because it's not broadcast but you know but it is we see a scene uh, where a pre from a previous battle yeah. royale where we see a survivor. But that's only at, like they only talk about the results. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, it's not it's not, not broadcast live in like the same Hunger way Games. Hunger Games is. Yeah, in that way, Hunger Games is a totally original concept. Yeah. So you've got some theories, Joe, about battle royale. Yeah, about what it all means. Um, this is mm -hmm. a few taken from uh, various various places um, and a few of my own. Okay. Um, so first of all. The, the, the key points to consider are that, number one, it's a representation of the hyper-competitive Japanese school system. Right. So the idea that kids are, you know, literally fighting over the best spots. Yeah. The best spot in Battle Royale being 
surviving. Yeah, or having an Uzi. Yeah, and the best spot in real life being like a nice university or like a scholarship to somewhere somewhere good, mm-hmm. right? And that's probably intentionally in there because it's a bit heavy-handed, right? Yeah. It's a bit obvious. Um, the next is the representation of zero-sum warfare. Okay. So the Japanese military uh, during World War II and probably later and before, I imagine, um, they had an approach to sort of international relations, which was that Japan would only succeed if the other superpowers were destroyed completely. Right. So that's why you get things like Pearl Harbor, right? Okay. The idea was if they eradicate the threat of America, then Japan can always be like on top. Mm-hmm. So Japan and Russia, uh, so US and Russia were seen as like these superpowers to overcome uh, through intense war. Yeah. And that is like how the game plays out. That like the only way to win is to eradicate all of your opponents. Yeah. Again, maybe a little heavy handed. I think for me, the more interesting sort of aspect that's explored mm. is the role of parents in Japan. Okay. So. Because they're basically absent from this film other than Shuya's father. Well, there's a couple of parents in here actually. Uh, and this is this. I did my own research, Chris, further than Wikipedia and, uh, and IMDb this time. Uh, so you may be familiar with the work of director Yasujiro Otsu. Uh, I am. Yeah. Because he did sort of lots of social dramas and uh, family representations. Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, he made, he made films in the 50s, 60s sort of era. Um, they were basically about how technology and modernization were corrupt were corrupting on the um, Japanese values. Right. As he saw them. Okay. Yeah, um, he's a very like traditional staid Japanese filmmaker, yes. isn't he? Like yeah. all of his films have like a really weird it's almost like Wes Anderson, like flat composition yeah. and detached like yeah. just like things play out on screen. The things happen in the background, but like it's literally the opposite of melodrama. Yeah. Like I don't know what that is. Disinterest. Yeah. Yeah. Um anti drama. <laughs> But in his movies, like the relationship between parents and their children mm. often comes to the fore, as you mentioned. Yeah. But it's based on tra- traditional Japanese values where the parents' presence in the children's lives when they grow up is seen as like an inconvenience. So in situations where parents want to hang out with their children yeah. uh, and were sent packing, Western audiences would like revile the children and say like, oh, you're ungrateful, you're unloving. Mm. Japanese audiences feel sympathy for the children who are being like bothered by their parents. Right. Um, the basic understanding is that Japanese parents are useful and welcome around mm-hmm. as long as they have something to give. Okay. But after that, they become a burden. Right. Right. And this is my interpretation of like various things I've read. And yeah, I don't yeah. want to sound like an orientalizing nitwit. So if right. I'm, this is just, you know, mm-hmm. what I gather. In Battle Royale, moving on from that, we only see two characters who are parents. Uh, the first is Nanahara's father, Shuya, as you uh, call him. Mm-hmm. You over familiarize yourself with this boy. That's what they make a point of that in the film. Like only his friends call him Shuya. Yeah. yeah. So Nanahara, uh, his father, who's emotionally distant and feels that he can't provide anything for Nanahara, mm-hmm. who appears to be completely disinterested in his father's attempts to give him advice. Yeah. Uh, Nanahara's it's father... the point in driving his father to suicide. <laughs> yeah, basically, yeah. Uh, yeah. But he's also incapable of using modern technology. Right. To the point where like, he's complaining that his phone won't work because he yeah, can't get a signal. Yeah. And he says, I keep phoning up for jobs and they hang up on me. So he's like completely incapable of... like. Yeah, adults interacting with the modern world. Yeah, uh, so he kills himself, and the only thing he really leaves to Nanahara is the idea of like just go for it or like keep yeah. going. The other parent we see is Kitano, a teacher. Mm-hmm. Uh, his own daughter is ungrateful and abusive, and says like, "Get that phone away from your mouth." I can smell your breath from here or something. <laughs> right. So he hoped Noriko would win the battle royale. Yeah. Because she represents like an obedient child because she's the only one who turns up to school. Yeah. Uh, and he even has a dream about her being his daughter. Very yeah. cool. Which she seems to share that dream in the literal sense that they have the same dream at the same time. Yeah. But she seems a bit less happy about it. Yeah. She wakes up like, I dreamt about him like it was. Yeah. Well, they, they, we did, one thing we didn't touch on in the synopsis is that when they find Kitano at the end, mm. he's done a really bad painting of the island and yeah. all the kids dead apart from Noriko. Noriko. Yeah. Yeah. Weird. He's, yeah, he's a strange character. Uh, well, they also find him doing like calisthenics on his own. Yeah. In this like weird Japanese traditional way. Like PE way. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, but he literally earlier on in the film tries to help Noriko by yeah. giving her an umbrella and the general advice like, keep dry, don't catch cold. Yeah. Uh, but when she sides with Nanahara and Kawanda, mm. he realizes that he can't give her anything. Like he has no use. 
Uh, and at that point, he basically tricks Nanahara into killing him. Yeah. Uh, incidentally, when when Noriko visits her own parents in the uh, the epilogue, mm-hmm. uh, they literally sleep through her visit. Like, yeah. Uh, which is pretty telling. A final nod to the role of parents comes in the final scene. Earlier in the film, Kawanda claims to have learned about like basic medicine because his father is a doctor. Yeah. Uh, but now he claims to be able to drive a boat because his father is a fisherman. Yeah. He also says that he can cook because his father's a chef. Does he? Yeah. There we are. Uh, ultimately, I think it, it doesn't matter mm. who or what his father was because he beat the system under his own merit. Yeah. Um, so ultimately, the adults have nothing to offer the children in Battle yeah. Royale. Other than scribbled notes of uh, good luck yeah. on toilet paper. Yeah. And as soon as they realise that, uh, they win the game. They beat the system. Mm. That's interesting. Interesting theories. I like mm. the way that it ties into Japanese culture. It seems to make yeah. a lot of sense. Um, I don't... I mean, that's it's possible to read it that way without having yeah. my supposed interpretation of... Uh, Ozu's movies. Yeah. yeah. So it's basically that all adults are inherently useless. Yeah. But that doesn't really... T- like, outside of that is all of the killing of... Like, all the children killing each other. Yeah. Like, that doesn't... Fa- like those two things don't really factor into one another well, at it's all. It's kind of like if you play it... Like, if you play the parents' game, if you play the adults' game, you die. Yeah. I guess so, But as yeah. soon as you say, like, we right. don't need them. So, because the people who win are the ones who don't play the game. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. When you think for themselves. Yeah. Make their own make their own luck. Yeah, make their own way in the world. Some top quality film theory there from Thank Joe. You. Thanks. But um I do have another sort of thing that I picked up on, but I'm I'm not smart enough, Chris, to connect the dots on it. Right. But I think it's important. And I think it's about like the influence of like Western like media and Western ideals on Japanese culture. Okay. I think I don't know enough about Japanese culture to really articulate it properly, but I'm pretty sure having like the landscape shots of like crashing waves on Japanese coastlines and like sprawling mountain ranges, they're obviously Pacific uh, and Japanese, but having like Verdi's Requiem and like the Radetzky March by Strauss, right? Uh, or Bach's Orchestral Suite Number no. Three in D minor. Mm-hmm. Uh, Iconic bits of music, all, but all Western music. So it's a bit of like a kind right. of inferiority thing, or possibly. I just, post-war, it's a, it's a bit colonialism, dissociative, isn't it? Because you're looking at Jap- Japan and you're hearing yeah. like Western Germany, like maybe, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like, Fascist sort of undertones to it. Maybe? It could be, but I don't know. It's a, it's just obviously not Japanese, hmm. and that's jarring. Yeah, for me it was. And I couldn't watch another second of it. Which is good, because it was the end. Uh, Very interesting. What do we know about the Battle Royale, though? And is there anything about it that's not exactly the same as the Hunger Games? Mm, The collars. Right, yeah. I mean, but you do, in the Hunger Games, it could be like, they just drop a a, a hive of zapper jappers. (laughs) Zapper jappers. Are they good? Tracker jackers. Right, exactly, yeah. Yeah. What is what is that? Oh, let's not get into it. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, like, obviously, the, other than the differences in technology. Yeah, you mentioned the collars. Mm-hmm. Um, we didn't mention that in the synopsis because it doesn't really end up playing into the movie at all. Right. Um, that they, they are all fitted with collars, yeah. which um, if you go into one of the danger zones that are read out at the start of the day, like areas on a map... Um, then uh, it will blow up and it will kill you. Uh, and blow the only, your jugular out. Yeah, and the only person we see die from that is Shuya's friend at the start of the film, who uh, basically Kitano activates his collar for yeah, him. Yeah, to demonstrate how it works. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. That, yeah. But they don't, like I said, they don't really factor into it other than that. Yeah. I, I mean, guess they, they, they prevent you from leaving the island. Yeah, well, yeah, but they don't. Yeah, but they wouldn't be able to leave the island anyway, would they? Why? Because they don't have any means to do that. But they're not inclined to either. What? I don't know. No one like jumps over and swims for it because they just blow up. Well, yeah, but they like, but they they drown anyway. They're yeah, in the middle true. of nowhere. That's true. That's what I mean. It's like you know, there's no. It's not like there's um, a helicopter. Yeah. 
like or a you know airliner that's leaving you know, <laughs> just jump on the back yeah. yeah um yeah and rather than having special skills they're all assigned uh weapons you know they're all given packages basically that contain weapons yeah. and i mean survival it, it is a pretty even playing field in fact it's weird that like none of their skills like the runner doesn't have any situations where she like Has runs to, really fast and exactly, like, yeah. beats someone up and like yeah. the the only person who tries to use their skill is like the nerd in this weird yeah, scene where he's hacker. like, no, 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 the, the nerdy guy, not the hacker, but like the guy with glasses who's like, he's walking up the hill going like, B squared is the root of uh, F over pi. Right. And like, they're just looking at him like, what the fuck well, are you talking just, about? Yeah, but that's not using his skill. That's just him going mad. <laughs> like he's just shouting like formulas at them yeah. for no reason yeah because yeah. he's, he's mental yeah, yeah. The, i mean yeah the, the hacker guy the one who hacks into the system that the army has to track them and they've built a bomb and everything he's the one who who uses his skills but i guess in a way it's like saying that it doesn't matter about their skills because it doesn't factor into it at all do you know what i mean like it's, it's pointless having any skills because mm. they, they don't help you yeah um is it even playing for? Yeah. Uh, well, it is aside from the weaponry, Joe, and I want to sort of <laughs> move into uh, talking about how to survive. Okay. Right? Because obviously they don't get the choice of weaponry. Uh, in the case of Koanda, who goes back in the room and says, this is my bag. Yeah. Takes the one with the shotgun in it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well. But he knows that the game, and no one else, including the, the crazy guy. Yeah. They don't know how the game works. They don't know what's in the bags. No. Would you like to know... Uh, which weapon gets the most kills? It's quite obvious. Not the the sickle. Like going to get no. a couple. Um, I mean, the Uzi sprays a lot of people. Yeah, so that that kills a number of people. Yeah, um, kills at least three people in the lighthouse. Yeah. obviously Yuka has one, and then obviously um, by the cliffside when when the crazy guy first gets yeah, it. Yeah, Kiriyama, who is the who's the crazy guy. The volunteer. Yeah, yeah. He um, he kills about fifteen people, I think. Yeah, uh, with it. Uh, including about six people in the first scene that he's in yep. uh, when he steals it. And then basically every other character that he encounters. Yep. Uh, the three boys who are preparing the bomb. Yeah. The two girls on the hill, on the hilltop who are trying to signal to other people. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and basically everyone else that he encounters. So uh, yeah, the Uzi's, um, Uzi's there. Good weapon for uh, causing chaos mm. or like indirectly causing deaths is the poison mm. because it only actually kills one person, but inadvertently causes the deaths of about five other people. Because it sows the seeds of uh, paranoia. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So maybe a survival tactic would be, listen, guys, let's put our differences aside. I've cooked this lovely dinner for yeah. us all. Yeah. Everyone take a bite at the same time, please. Yeah. Pardon on three, me. one, two. I'm just going to take a photo. Yeah. <laughs> As you said, there are some useless items in there as well, not weapons at all. There's a pot lid. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a paper fan. Yeah. And then my personal favourite are the boxing gloves. Yes. Because boxing gloves, Joe, they are actually protecting the people that you're hitting yeah. as opposed to helping you kill them. <laughs> it protects your hands. Yeah. Yeah. But it was, it's also basically padding for their face. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Wow. That's not what you want. And also, boxers wear boxing gloves because if they punch someone with their bare knuckles with the power that they generate, mm. it would, like, break every bone in their hand. Yes. Whereas I don't think that's the case for little Japanese school children. <laughs> Noriko can't generate that much power. No, I don't think Anthony Joshua versus Noriko. I think there's only one winner. Yeah. Battle Royale 3. <laughs> I had to skip one there because Battle Royale 2, Requiem, uh, is a movie. Yeah. Mm. Have you seen it? Yes. Some years ago. But... Good. Well, episode 132. Yeah. We'll be back in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> Not a moment before. Yeah, maybe we'll cover that at some point in the future. Yeah. Any survival tactics, Joe? So basically my survival tactic there was either get an Uzi. Yeah. Or poison. Yeah. Because those are the highest hit rates. Yeah. Or causality related hit rates. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I have to hark back to when we talked about Hunger Games last week, Chris. Can you remember what my key piece of advice was? Kill everyone. Yep. Yeah. Kill everyone. I mean, what? how do you survive the Hunger Games? 
But everyone. you've just said that it's only when you stop playing by the rules that are set by the adults that they survive. The only people who survive well, the film, yeah. The only people who survive the film are the ones who don't murder anyone. Thematically speaking, yes. And literally speaking. But that's also like you're also relying on the fact that uh the adults Joe, the how, adult many, how many of the people how many of the people who we see are willful killers mm. survive the movie? None, but that's beside the point. Is it beside the point, given that we're a podcast about surviving the movie? Here's here's something I want to And you're positing that to survive you should be a murderer. The only reason, right, that the three survivors survived, and bear in mind, Kiwanda didn't actually survive. He died in the boat. So the only reason two people survived. So the only reason those two people survived, right? Right. Were able to survive. Yeah. Is because the hacker guy uh, was able to beat the adults' system because they're not au fait with technology. Right. It's the youth catching up with the adults, right? Okay. It's just one, one step in a ladder, right? But had the hacker not been there, if you were in a, a battle royale the following year and there was no... I think uh, you're bending over backwards to not have your theory come undone around your ears because you've just spent 10 minutes detailing how the people who survive the film are the ones who don't play by the rules set out by the adults. Mm. And now suddenly what you're saying is play the game and murder everyone. This year, I'll admit, because... Because thematically speaking, from like our point of view, yeah, like not playing the, the adults game worked, right? That makes sense for right. this battle royale. If it was another battle royale where they had like a superior firewall and this guy couldn't hack it, right? Because the only reason they get in there is because their the collars are turned off, their tracking collars. Get in where? Get into the system. Oh, I see. And shut it down. Because you see, yeah, the, yeah, the hacker, but that, that that doesn't affect the result. It does. Who? Because it, it tur- he turns off the pulse readers. Yeah, yeah, but they all die anyway. Yeah, the hackers do. But the only reason uh, Nanahara and Nariko are able it's to not, survive... Are they pulse readers? Yeah. Do we see that? Yeah. Really? Yeah. I thought it was just microphones and trackers. No, it's pulse readers. Mm. In any, even if it's just trackers, it's still the same thing. Mm. I still think that you're contravening your own ideas. Plus, if you're talking specifically about the protagonists are you saying are you saying if you find yourself in that situation that's what you should do yeah right fair enough if you're nanohara yeah don't worry he you survive anyway Great. if you're <laughs> if you're me if i was dropped in there with those kids yeah i'd kill them all wouldn't even think <laughs> you wouldn't even think no. Great. well that's recipe for success there yeah yeah uh I've got another suggestion Go for survival. Um, it's a little bit of a dark one. Okay. Uh, the you mentioned you alluded to it earlier uh, in terms of causes of death. Yeah. Um, they're all quite emotionally unstable, aren't they, Joe? Um, all quite willing to pack it all in. Well, I will. I will say that it's an in, like. It's not like they've. They're like at home. No, I know. Yeah, it's an it's an intoler- in, intolerable situation. Yeah, yeah. But were you a nefarious individual, mm. you could be going, "Oh, it's bad, isn't it? This is awful. I can't live with this." All right. Come on, let's jump off this cliff. Three, two, one. Yeah. Invite them to jump, and then they jump, and yeah. you just go, "Yep, great." Right. And then you find the next emotionally unstable <laughs> teenager and yeah. go convince them for a suicide God, pact as oh, well. I just saw Noriko. She had she had the right idea. I tell you, she <laughs> <laughs> she jumped off the cliffs. Yeah, should we? Yeah. Three, yeah. two, one. <laughs> uh, I mean, you can oh, just get in the stand next to the cliff and just she, like, uh, she, you won't believe this. <laughs> you haven't seen what Noriko and uh, Sugiyama have done. <laughs> Yeah, should we? I think we. Yeah. All right. Three, two. <laughs> Yuki, I know you've had a crush on me for the whole of school. This is a wonderful base you've set up in the lighthouse, but listen, what would be really romantic <laughs> is if we. Should we go to the top of the lighthouse and. Yeah. Okay. Three, two. 
Yuko, have you seen what <laughs> oh, have you seen what Yuki's just done? Your best friend Yuki. She are you yeah, I'll meet you up there. Oh. Yuka. <laughs> Put that plate down. Come upstairs. Come and have a look at because they've <laughs> Kotahiki, I, I don't think we've <laughs> I don't think we've properly. I mean, I know we've had a lot of a lot of classes together, but I mean, you you seem like a nice girl. Um, I think we should. Here's a bit of rope. Where are you getting these names? I'm reading them. <laughs> are you reading them. I'm re- here's a bit of rope. I think. Come on, let's. And then and then what you've done is you've cut your length of rope. So when you so it snaps, <laughs> but hers doesn't. Right. And then you go ah. Oh, you, uh, Sugimura, you loved Kotehiki. Sugimura. <laughs> Sugimura, you loved uh, Kotehiki, didn't yeah, you? Yeah, yeah. Um, look what she's done. Maybe, <coughs> you know what would be really romantic? If you joined her in the, yeah, there you go. Right, I'll give you this rope. <laughs> Don't ask me where I got it. I know it looks a lot like the rope that she's used. Don't worry about it. And then pretty soon, Joe, all you, do, all you need to do is that 42 times. 42 times, yeah. And you're laughing. Yeah. After, yeah. And even even when you get back to Kitano, go, oh, Noriko, she... Uh, you had a peg to win, didn't you? Uh, it's embarrassing, isn't it? Yeah. Well, he, he does basically kill himself. Isn't he? Well, that is true, yeah. Well, he's, yeah, he's up for it then. He's game. He's on, he's on your side, if anything. Mm. And basically, yeah, just uh, manipulate all these uh, emotionally um, vulnerable <laughs> Japanese teenagers into killing themselves. It would take quite um, quite a poker face, wouldn't it? Yeah, but I, you know, in a if if it was me and you in this world yeah. where everyone's really melodramatic, yeah. I think it would we're comparatively quite, quite speaking, we'd yeah. be we'd be able to we'd be Measured. able to pull it off. Yeah, cooler heads prevail. Yeah, yeah. Fair enough. I get- so like um, forty-two false suicide pacts is yeah. your method of survival. Exactly, yeah. Because wow. clearly, the vast majority of these people seem to be open to it. Yeah, <laughs> willing. Yeah, one idea, which is more of a logistical sort of theory. Okay. And this this does depend on you getting a good weapon to start with. Right. Okay. So, so, so thinking- you've probably got like. A one in three chance. Getting a handgun Uzi, ideally. Yeah. Um, I guess like the axe or the sickle, these could work quite well. Essentially what you're doing, Chris, is uh, ideally you want to be quite high up in the chain as well. Right. So what I'm, I'm Joe Sherb, I'd be quite low down as an S. As an M, you'd be somewhere in the middle. Yeah. Chris Morris. Um, say your name is Albertson. Yeah. You'd be well in with, with my theory. Yeah. Albertson out first with his Uzi. Stand by the front door, and as soon as anyone walks out, blow their head off. Yeah. Well, there, there there is a guy who does that with a crossbow. Basically, one girl walks out and basically gets shot in the neck with a crossbow. Yeah, but he's shit, isn't he? Yeah. He hasn't got the balls. He hasn't got the the minerals to back it up. Yeah. So okay, what well, like so if you had the sickle, you'd stand like just by the doorway. Yeah. <laughs> and as they came running out, just go. Pfft. Yeah. Just like slit it. And like. It. Yeah. Soon there'd be a pile of bodies, 41 people high. <laughs> yeah, but you've got the sickle out. They haven't got their weapon out of their bag yet. Right. So you've got to do is just slash at them. Hmm. Even if you just like wound them. Because like, yeah. it's, I mean, on, on the one hand, if you if I was to slash you across the back, mm. that would do a lot of muscular damage. You're yeah. going to stand up probably. Mm. So I'd just like kick you. But in Battle Royale, it seems that you can take gunshot wounds to the spine and just like walk around the room. Yeah. Which is quite confusing. Very confusing. Mm. Okay, interesting. So basically just get your weapon out straight away and ambush them as they come out. Yeah. What if you've got a pot lid? If I had a pot lid, yeah. I could probably kill you with it. That's big talk, mate. I mean, like... I, have you seen these boxing gloves? <laughs> <laughs> but it's like... Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It's doable. It's not ideal. Hmm. But then you've got fists as well. Yeah. They don't do enough, do they? They're relying on those weapons. Yeah. Be interesting to see a battle royale where all the weapons are just like stuff that you'd find around the house. Yeah. A good yeah. lamp. A broom. Yeah. And a, yeah. What would be the best household object that's not like a knife or whatever? Um, 
Raid or Bleach or something. What? Just throw it in their face? Or... Yeah, like some sort of like solvent you can just chuck in their eyes. That's, you have to be very close for that, eh? It's true. And if they've got a rolling pin, they can just yeah. smack you with it. <laughs> rolling, um, pin. rolling pin would be good. Iron, what? an iron. Yeah. What about a, a lamp? Like a, you know, like a floor lamp? Big pole, basically. Right, yeah. Have yeah, you seen yeah. the Dead Set? Yeah. The, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. A certain television presenter cameos as a zombie. You can, I mean, you can say it. It's 15 years old. <laughs> <laughs> Davina McCall gets yeah. a, a lamppost through the eye. Yeah. Yeah. So that was episode 66 of the How to Survive podcast. And uh, now you know all about how you would survive. Carry out episode 66. Battle Royale. Do you that? Huh? Episode Carry out order six, 60. Yeah. Episode 66. Well done. Yes, that's a Star Wars reference for that. Spoilers. Um, yeah, so thanks very much for listening. Up next, Joe, <laughs> we've got a rival. Who? Who's the rival? No one rivals us. Yeah. Uh, no, it's the new Amy Adams, Jeremy Renner, uh, alien invasion population. Who knows? Aliens come to Earth, basically. Yep. Um, it's called Arrival. It will have just come out. Uh, so it'll be really uh, a hot. If you, you want to be tuning in for our hot takes. Yeah. Um, Before you talk to your friends about it, listen to us first so you yeah. can recycle our words and pretend exactly. like you were intelligent. Yeah. That's uh, what you do anyway, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, pe- people that go to work, they'll go to work tomorrow and they'll be like, hey, you know, I was thinking about the uh, 2000 Battle Royale movie yeah. and um, I think it's really about uh, parenthood. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very much that. Mm. Um, yeah, so arrival next week. Yep. Uh, in and the meantime... The week after that? The War of the Worlds. The 2005 version. Yeah. Steven Spielberg, Tom Cruise, Dakota Fanning, yeah. Michael Madsen. Yeah. Um, extravaganza yeah yeah. Uh, and in the meantime if you've got any thoughts on Arrival if you've got any thoughts on the War of the Worlds then please get in touch the email address is howtosurviveshow at gmail.com the twitter is at howtosurvivepod and if you've got any feedback for us then you can always leave us a review on iTunes which helps us reach a wider audience which is very good for us Mm. in the meantime Joe konnichiwa origato Arigato for listening, everyone. Sayonara till next week. Mm-hmm.